the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. What sign do you show us for doing these things? The people in the temple that day were understandably perplexed and outraged because the prophet from Nazareth had come and he was wielding something like a cat of nine tails and he was putting an end to the money changing business and the livestock sale that was going on there within the temple complex. And this was a perfectly legitimate business, by the way. There was no sin exactly in what they were doing because the money changers in the temple dealt in the shekel. And the shekel is the temple currency. And so when you came to the temple, you brought your Roman currency and you exchanged it for the temple currency. And then you used the shekel to buy the animal that had to be sacrificed as atonement for your sins. And you needed atonement for your sins. And so then Jesus, with bullwhip or whatever he had in hand, when he comes in and all the sheep and the ox and the doves and the money changers, they're all fleeing before him. And he declares, do not make my father's house a house of trade. So what about atonement? So the Jews are understandably scandalized by Jesus' violent behavior. Because what prophet has the right to assault God's temple? You might remember that we heard last week that the people were always confusing Jesus with just another one of the prophetic voices that they'd heard. Jesus uh, asked his disciples last week, who do the crowds say that I am? And some said that he was John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. But Jesus has not come to do the work of a prophet when you think about it. Because prophets just show the way to the Father. Jesus hasn't come to show us the way because Jesus is the way to the Father. He is the fulfillment of every prophecy and every promise. Jesus has not come into the temple in Jerusalem to reform the temple. Because that's the sort of thing that a prophet would do. A prophet can lead Israel in reform. But Jesus is not a mere prophet. He is the one that's been testified to by all the prophets. He's the one who the prophet Malachi foretold, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into His temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord may do whatever He wants to do with His own temple when He comes into it. And the Lord's sentence on that day was very clear. This business is finished. It's as the prophet Zechariah said, there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day, on the day when the Lord comes. There's no longer any need for shekels or sacrifices or money changers or even this building. Because even the building is just a dim shadow of the true temple that has come. Atonement is going to be fully accomplished, but it doesn't happen on Mount Moriah where Jesus was standing in the temple, but it will happen on Mount Calvary. When Isaac, Abraham's son, was spared there on Mount Moriah, on the temple mount, he got his life back. But Jesus is not going to be rescued from the place of the skull. And the crowds don't understand what Jesus is doing, but the disciples come to understand in time. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house 
will consume me, which was our intro at today, you might have noticed. Now when Jesus is raised and the Holy Spirit is given so that the disciples can understand what Jesus has taught, they recall this scripture, which is taken from Psalm 69. And uh, the full verse is not quoted in John, uh, but it helps us to understand what this all-consuming zeal really is. This is how the full verse reads. Zeal for your house will consume me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Jesus is not consumed with godly zeal for Herod's temple. He didn't really care much for it, as you probably see. But Jesus is consumed. He's truly devoured when sinners do exactly what the psalmist said. When they heap their reproaches on Him as He hangs crucified and humiliated and disgraced. And on that day, the people also demand a sign, just like they do in the temple. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Now it's true, it was just as true in fact, in Paul's day as it was in Jesus' day, as we heard uh, in our epistle lesson, Jews demand signs. And so Jesus promises the temple goers, who are all Jews, a sign that's going to trump every sign that they could have imagined. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And the crowds once again miss that Jesus isn't seeking to uphold the old order of things. He doesn't merely want to reform the old order. It's not that he wants the Levitical laws or Herod's temple to stand. Jesus isn't doing what a prophet does. He isn't pointing beyond himself to something else, but he's testifying of himself. And how do they respond? You might have heard things like this in churches before. It took us 46 years to build this temple. And you think that you can tear it down and rebuild it in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. There is no temple apart from the body of Jesus. He is his Father's house. He prepares his Father's house when He goes to die, when He's crucified, bearing the sins of the world, and suffering and dying, Jesus is the place of sacrifice. He is the Holy of Holies. He is the true temple. And we know that the only sign that will ever truly satisfy is the sign of the cross. But Jesus' sign It goes right over their heads. And sometimes we too miss these glorious things that are hidden in the words of Jesus. We read, for example, at the beginning of the Gospel, uh, that as Jesus came to Jerusalem, the Passover was near. And it's not just that the feast of the Passover was approaching, but the Passover Himself was coming into Jerusalem. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who bears the sins of the world, as John the Baptist cried out on Jordan's bank. As with those lambs sold in the temple, John tells us that the true Lamb of God was sacrificed the same dark Friday afternoon. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. And when Jesus dies, and the Romans see that they have no reason to break His legs and let suffocation finish their job, when they omit to do that, they're unwittingly fulfilling the Scripture which says, not one of His bones will be broken. And those words weren't originally spoken of Jesus. They were spoken of the first Passover lamb on the night of Israel's exodus from Egypt. 
applied to Jesus, who is the true Lamb. Not one of His bones will be broken. And here those words find their fulfillment in the sacrificial death of Jesus. The disciples remember these things and they invite us to dwell on them as well. So even when everybody else is thirsting after signs, they know that Jesus is fulfilling the Scriptures. Many believed when they saw the signs and the wonders. That's what John says. But Jesus on His part did not entrust Himself to them because He knew what was in man. A faith that is just built upon signs will falter. And so, if you simply believe in Jesus because of the miracle of the bread loaves, then you will never hail Him as the true bread of life that's come down from heaven. A miracle that's done in the past is history. It's confined to the past and it will fade first into memory and then it will fade from memory. Signs and prophecies will pass away. But my words, Jesus says, will not pass away. The word of the Lord endureth forever. The disciples, and we too, remember the Scriptures because Jesus is the one who remembers us. And it's in our remembrance of these things that He entrusts Himself to us. We know that Jesus is not the itinerant preacher. He's not the wonder worker. He's not the prophet who's come to reform the temple. But He's the one who Scripture promises. He is the true temple. He is the ultimate Paschal Lamb. He is the final Word who comes to us now. We don't seek the living among the dead of history. Jesus beckons us now and not to see signs that we'll witness and then go on our way, but with this meal and with these words spoken here, this do in remembrance of Me. We are not observers of Jesus' sideshow of signs and wonders. We are His members. We're stones built into His temple, the temple of His body, when we're born from above of water and the Spirit, as Jesus tells Nicodemus. So we enter His temple, purified from our sins, and we eat this sacrifice of His true body, His true blood, that we might be nourished with Him. And so nourished, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In place of the shekel, Jesus has given us the currency of atonement. And that's His own blood. In place of all other beasts, He's presented His own body as a living and a dying sacrifice. And in place of a building, which will crumble to ruin 40 years later when the Roman army levels the temple. Jesus gives you an everlasting home in His house, His body, when those same Romans do to Him whatever they please. But Jesus will have the final word as we look forward to Easter. St. Paul declares, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast. And so enter His temple and keep this Paschal feast of rich food and well-aged wine that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the Lamb slain for the sin of the world. Amen.